Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Lipner. Uh, welcome. Um, I hope you've all written down some notes from the first two talks. They were wonderful. Um, and right now, uh, we're going to transition just a little bit. So you've already heard about uh, some of the ways that we test people for allergies, uh, food allergies and other allergies. Um, and in my talk today or tonight, we're kind of going to hopefully um, hammer that in and hone that in even just a little bit more. Okay, so my objectives uh, for tonight, we're actually going to walk through a clinical story um, step by step, and we're going to see if we can make a food allergy diagnosis or uh, clear someone of not having a food allergy. So we kind of have already touched on this, but briefly there's four parts, um, potential parts of that food allergy diagnosis that we're going to talk about. So it's the clinical history. Uh, testing, so skin testing and blood testing. Uh, and then I'm also going to talk a little bit about these component uh, protein tests and then a food challenge. We're also going to talk about what to do with a positive food allergy test and what that actually means. Uh, and then we're also going to go through the details of food challenges, what they are, what they look like, how long they take, and what they tell us. So as Dr. McGee already mentioned, there's a whole spectrum of ways that your body can react to food. Um, and I just want to highlight that for the rest of the night, we're going to be talking about a specific food allergy. Um, and we're going to be talking about a specific food allergy that's associated and driven by IgE. So keep that in your mind. IgE is really going to be the big player for tonight. Uh, so how do we actually go about diagnosing someone with a food allergy? So as you've heard, um, there's two different types of testing. Uh, one is a skin test. The other is a blood test. So that's down here on the, your bottom left corner, lab tests. Uh, and then the third here is what actually happens to you when you eat that food. So that's that clinical history. That's that story of how does your body react. Okay. And one thing that we want to emphasize is that the most important part of that triangle is that bottom right corner. So the sort of gold standard would be if we could bring everybody in the world who thinks they may have a food allergy or who's even at risk for a food allergy and have them eat little bits of that food under medical supervision in the clinic. Obviously, that's not logistically feasible for us to do for everyone. Um, and a lot of people wouldn't need that. OK, so let's back up a little bit. Um, if I were to ask you, um, how do you know that your child has a food allergy? And I won't put anybody on the spot, but I just want you to think about that. What if someone from your child's school came up to you and said, I don't really understand. Can you just explain it to me? Like, what does that even mean that your child has a food allergy? How do you even know that that's the case? Okay. Um, and take it one step further. So what would your child say if her friend or his friend said, how do you know you have a food allergy? How would they begin to answer that question? Chances are uh, they might say something like this. When I eat peanuts, I get an itchy rash. Uh, if I drink milk, I get really sick. Um, I can't have nuts because one time I ate a nut and my face got really swollen. Um, or even I had a really hard time breathing and they had to call the ambulance. So these are all examples of clinical histories. So that story of what happens to you, to your child, to anyone out there when they eat a food. And once again, just want to point out that this is really the most important uh, piece of the puzzle when making that food allergy diagnosis. Okay, so. We'll talk a little bit about numbers later today, but this does often come up um, for us, and I'm sure it's come up uh, for some of you out there in the audience tonight. But let's say your, your neighbor has a kid who drinks milk every day and loves milk. He eats yogurt, he eats ice cream, he eats cheese, he loves pizza. Um, and then for some reason, you know, they do some allergy testing, and lo and behold, you know, his milk number comes up positive. Right? So does that mean he has a food allergy? No. He eats, he eats milk. He drinks milk all the time. All that tells us is that it's a bad test and that that number doesn't reflect what is actually going on in his body. Okay. So I want to introduce you to Amelia. She is a Crimson Tide fan. 
Um, and we're going to learn a little bit about her journey um, and walk through some clinic visits with her and see if she has a food allergy. So she's nine months old. Uh, she was uh, born before these new prevention guidelines really started to take hold. Uh, so she did not get any early introduction of allergenic foods. Uh, we're going to see if she has a food allergy. So we're going to walk through her clinical history, her allergy testing, and see if she needs a food challenge. Okay. So starting with her story, um, her parents took her to her nine-month well-child visit, and her pediatrician said, you know what, she has a little bit of eczema, and there are these new guidelines. Um, she doesn't really seem to have bad eczema. We, she doesn't have a problem with eggs. We don't know that because she's not eaten any eggs before. But why don't you go ahead and give her a little bit of peanut butter? So unfortunately for her, within 10 minutes of eating that snack, um, she develops hives along her face. This kind of spreads to her chest and to her arms. She gets itchy and she gets pretty fussy. So of course, her parents get worried. They bring her into the pediatrician's office. Um, she gets one dose of Benadryl and she's watched there for about an hour. Um, and after about 20 minutes, the rash starts to get better and she starts to get a little bit of sleepy from the Benadryl, but nothing else happens. So she's not vomiting, she's not getting swollen anywhere, her breathing's the same, she doesn't have any drop in her blood pressure. So she's starting to actually look okay. So this story um, is pretty suspicious for a food allergy reaction to peanut. So what's the next step? Again, now we're going to talk about testing. And I just want to hammer home again. We're going to be talking about IgE testing. So what we actually do when we do either skin testing or blood testing is that we're looking for the presence of these IgE antibodies that recognize food. So for the skin test here on that bottom right corner, um, this is just a little graphic representation of what our supplies look like. So in each one of these little wells is a different liquid that contains proteins of these foods. So one well is going to have peanut, the other is going to have egg, the other is going to have wheat, soy, etc. And then in the hand are these tiny little uh, tips, they're like little quintips, almost as if you could think of a push pin, but instead of a metal tip, it's a little plastic tip. What we do is we take that and we just kind of stamp it on the skin. So it just breaks that very top layer of the skin, as Dr. McGee already told us. And if you get something like this that pops up here, kind of looks like a hive. So that, for us, would be a significant or a positive reaction on a skin test. Okay. The other way that we do allergy testing, and sometimes we do use both, um, is blood testing. So classically, we get a blood sample from your child, we send it off to the lab, and what do they do with it? They take that blood and they mix it with different, uh, same thing, different food proteins. And if your child's blood has IgE that recognizes that food protein, then we can measure that. Okay. Um, so one thing I want to point out here, so we have just a little representation of an IgE molecule on the left and an allergy protein. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that you're going to get these test results back and they will give you a number. So it'll be three or four or five, sometimes even as high as 15. But that doesn't, that number alone doesn't tell us what your reaction or what your child's reaction is going to look like. So someone who has a number of five versus someone who has a number of 10 may actually look very much the same when they eat the food. It doesn't mean that a higher number means a worse reaction. So now, we're going to talk about component proteins. And I told you that when we look at your blood in the, in the lab, we're looking for food proteins. But you can imagine a peanut isn't made up of just one peanut protein, right? There's lots of different proteins. And so um, it's now been published and well established that there are some proteins for certain foods where if your test is positive, you may have a higher risk of having a severe reaction like anaphylaxis. And there are some proteins that if your test is positive to those proteins, you have a lower risk of a severe reaction or anaphylaxis. So that's what these component proteins are. They help us um, stratify the risk of a severe reaction. And you can't do that from classic blood testing or classic skin testing. 
So as an example, really quickly, I'm just going to talk about two. So um, these are both proteins that are found in peanut. Um, that family is all labeled ERA, H, and then a number. So two here are ERA, H2, and ERA, H8. Um, and people who are sensitized, that means have a positive test to ERA, H2, have a much higher risk of having a severe reaction than someone who is sensitized to or who has a positive um, test to ERA, H8. So um, in one study, for example, there uh, they looked at all of these different proteins and your risk of a severe reaction based on whether you had a positive or a negative test to these proteins. Um, and people who had a positive test to ARH8 were much more likely to have milder symptoms. So things like a little bit of skin symptoms or even just some irritation in the mouth. OK, so naturally then, now you all want to know, so what's best? What do we do? These are our two options, but which is the very best way to know? Um, and unfortunately, as Dr. McGee already kind of told us, testing really isn't that end-all, be-all. It's not the home run. So um, overall, we say that skin testing and blood testing are both pretty equally effective in giving us a little bit more information about what's going on in your body or your child's body in relation to food allergies. But it does not alone make that diagnosis. So I just want to give you a couple of pros and cons for each for uh, each of these tests for you to think about for your own lives. Um, so for blood testing, the pros um, are basically that you can test for those component proteins. It's the only way right now that we have to test for those component proteins. Um, and I should say this is a little bit controversial, and it's not uh, used everywhere uh, across all allergy office across the world. So every population is a little bit different. Um, another advantage is you can test for as many allergens as you need to, or you can test for many blood tests, right? So if you're going to have um, other tests done, sort of routine screening tests, um, we can add that all in once. You get one blood stick, right? One stick, and you're done. Um, another advantage is, let's say, uh, your child has asthma or has really bad seasonal allergies, and you want to get evaluated for food allergies. Chances are you're going to be taking some, or your child will be taking some medications that could interfere with our skin testing. And with blood testing, you can keep taking those medications. The cons are, you know, there. There is a needle involved. Your child will not like it. Um, and then also the results can take longer. So when we do skin testing in the office, the whole process takes, you know, maybe at most 30 minutes um, if your child is really squeamish or you have to bribe your kid in order to do it. Um, but usually it's, it's pretty quick. So you can walk out of the office with some results in your hand. Whereas for blood tests, you're going to have to wait a couple of days. Um, and sometimes for those component tests, you have to wait a couple of weeks. Um, some of the cons for skin testing, though, um, is when you do a blood test, you get one needle stick and then you're done. Uh, for the skin testing, as you saw, you can get a little bit of a hive if you have a positive test. So it can be a little bit itchy, a little bit uncomfortable. You would have to potentially stop some medications. And if your child has a lot of eczema or, let's say, other skin concerns, that may limit where we're able to do the testing on your body. So it may not be ideal for everyone. OK, so let's go back to Amelia now. We're going to look at her allergy testing. We're going to look at all of it. So on the right-hand side, you see that um, what probably happened is uh, she went to see either her pediatrician or her allergist, and this was a big scare, and they decided to be on the safe side, not just to test for peanut, but let's say test for egg, test for milk, test for soy. Um, so on the right-hand side, you see these are all representing blood tests. So these are those classic IgE to generic peanut protein to generic milk protein. Um, and you see that her numbers are positive to peanut and egg. In the middle here, you see her skin testing results. So she's also positive to peanut and egg. And then on the left-hand side, you see these ERA H family. And those are those peanut components. And I'm running a little bit short on time, but I just want to point out that ERA H1 is very similar to ERA H2 in the sense that if you have a positive result to it, if you have a positive number, so you are sensitized, 
uh, then you may be at higher risk for a severe reaction. So again, we keep saying a positive test, though, does not automatically mean a food allergy, right? So what does that mean? So for her, what does that mean? Remember, when we do these tests, we're looking for the presence of IgE. So what it means is that in your body, either in your blood or in the uh, mast cells that lie just under the surface of the skin, there's IgE sitting there that recognizes these food proteins. So if you come into contact with those food proteins, you could have a reaction. So that's what we call sensitized. Um, but it may be a false positive, right? So remember again that if you pulled someone off the street and they had no reported history of a food allergy, and then you tested them and they tested positive for an allergy, um, that really only increases their risk from 1 in 100 to 2 in 100. And so this is kind of a similar uh, representation here um, down in the bottom from FAIR. But basically, it equates it to um, about a coin toss. So if you just look at testing in general, about up to 50 to 60% of these tests could be falsely positive. Okay. So again, to have that diagnosis, we really need a positive story, a positive reaction, and tests that support that. So again, let's go back to Amelia. So um, do we think she has a food allergy? Yeah? Yeah, I would agree. So she has um, positive skin testing, positive blood testing, positive component testing, and she has a story that's pretty suspicious. So she's kind of got all four things going for her. So it's pretty clear cut for her. Um, so in the question of does she need a food challenge, at this point, actually, some people would say she doesn't need a food challenge. We have all of the information. We have all four pieces that we need to say she has a peanut allergy diagnosis. Um, but for some people, it's not that clear. So really quickly, if you recall, she also had uh, positive egg testing on both her skin and her blood. So let's say she had never eaten egg before, right? So now we know in her body, she has these antibodies. She has this IgE that recognizes egg. She's at risk for having a reaction to egg when she eats it. Um, it may be similar to peanut. It may be worse. It may be nothing. But that risk is there. And if we don't know what happens when she eats egg, um, then she might benefit from a food challenge. Okay. Um, so now we're going to talk just this very last section about what to expect from a food challenge. Uh, so this is also done slightly differently, potentially across different uh, allergy offices and different clinics. Uh, but generally speaking, a food challenge is basically a controlled test where we bring you into a very safe, controlled, monitored environment, and we feed you a little bit of that uh, suspicious food or that potential food allergy. And it takes a long time. So it takes probably a good three to four hours before you eat enough of that food uh, to where we can say you've eaten enough to where if you were allergic, you should have had a reaction. So it starts out with a very small amount. Every 15 to 20 minutes, you eat a little bit more. Um, if you do or your child does start to have any signs of an allergic reaction, so a little bit of hives pop up or coughing or stomach upset and you f your child feels like he or she needs to vomit, we would definitely stop that food challenge. You know, you're in a facility so we can treat you medically. Um, and so just a couple other things to point out um, is that this is not the same as oral therapy or oral desensitization. We'll hear a little bit more about what that is and what that entails after the break. Uh, but this is just a one point in time uh, test. And the other thing to think about is um, if your child is scheduled for a food allergy coming up, but let's say they're not feeling well, they had a fever you know, a couple of days ago, or their asthma is really acting up, then that would not be an opportune time for us to do the food challenge. So you should really be in as you know, good a health as possible for us to do this, to get the clearest picture of what will happen. Okay. So in conclusion, um, remember there's a lot of features that we talk about today when we're talking about food allergies, but the most important thing is really what happens when you eat that food and everything else is just extra. Skin testing and blood testing generally have roughly the same efficacy. Um, and remember that just because a test is positive doesn't mean 
that that person is allergic to it. Um, component protein uh, testing right now is a tool, the one tool that we do use sometimes to help us risk stratify whether uh, you could have a severe reaction. Um, and then food challenges are just really something that should only be done under the supervision of a physician um, in an allergy office. Okay. And that's all I have. So I think we'll have a break now, right? Okay.